I've spent the week experimenting and was able to create this complex and organic shape without any layer lines and without the need for support material. Let me show you how using thermoforming and compression molding. Ready printing as a form of additive manufacturing makes it possible to create some shapes that couldn't be made with any other technique. It does sometimes have limitations, so let me give you an example. As a Formula 1 fan, I would love to have a scale version of a front wing hanging on my wall. The trouble is that all of those thin contours are going to be very hard to 3D print. Here's a simplified version of one. It's not going to sit nicely on the build platform and putting it up on its side it's going to have a high probability of working loose and failing. But here we have a much more complicated shape that I was able to create using 3D printing as a basis. It has no layer lines and it didn't require any support material. If you're wondering how this is possible, well, this video is for you. I'm going to walk you through how to use thermoforming and compression molding to create shapes that couldn't be 3D printed in a traditional way. We're also going to enlist the help of some bright young engineers to give it some context. Let's start by having a closer look at our geometry. Our wavy surface is created by lofting between three sketches with the lower and upper halves of the mold created in the exactly the same way. If we bring in the wavy surface to the slicer, we can see we're going to have a hard time with no flat surface to base it on. And if we stick it up on its side, at best it's going to wobble, but more likely it's going to become dislodged. So how is it that I can repeatedly produce this geometry without even having any layer lines? The answer is thermoforming. Thermoforming takes a flat sheet of plastic and converts it into a contoured shape. The end piece is generally the same thickness throughout and we need a two part mold. Our plastic sheet does need to be oversized and we start by heating it up until it becomes pliable. After this, we bring together the two halves of the mold, shaping the plastic and when it eventually cools down, we can trim off extra material around the edges, open the mold, and we have our finished piece. The best way to make the two mold pieces is on a CNC router, zigzagging a ball nose cutter over the surface of the mold at very high resolution. Each parallel pass is only removing around 0.2 millimeters of material. These mold pieces are 100 by 100 millimeters, and each takes around 90 minutes to machine. For this mold I used MDF and it machines quite well but it should be noted that the dust is very hazardous to breathe in. In Australia, MDF is banned for students to use in school workshops. I understand not everyone has a CNC router so I also explored printing the molds using PETG. For this I used Prusa Slicer and the variable layer feature. We select our object and then click on the icon up the top and we're presented with a new interface. We have a choice between adaptive and smooth, and we kick things off by clicking one of those. We'll then notice that the model is color coded and we have this graph down the side telling us what layer height for each section when we hover the mouse over. At the bottom, we can see a coarse layer height of 0.25 and that drops to 0.07 for the rest of the model due to the shallow contours. We can change the slider and re-click adaptive and it will recalculate and this time we can see the blue line has changed. In some more vertical sections, we have a layer height as high as 0.12. As the instructions state, if we come over to the graph and then right or left click, we can add or remove detail for that specific area. In this place, I've increased the layer height and as you would expect, the print time would be faster at the expense of more obvious layer lines. We can revert back to the preset by re-clicking the adaptive button and once we're happy, we simply click slice now as we usually would. We're still able to manually cycle through the layers and we can see their layer height is variable as the object is built up vertically. I printed the two mold halves in PETG and each side took somewhere around six to seven hours. The finished result is really quite good. This is without any sanding or post-processing. You can see a staircase effect but it's only 0.07, so it's actually quite smooth to the touch. This means we have a complete set of molds from various materials, and we're ready to attempt some thermoforming. If we recall, we need some flat sheet, and it needs to be bigger than the sides of the mold. 
I printed my blanks in PLA and added 10% to the horizontal and vertical distances. For moulding, I'm working on a Wham Bam slap mat. They're high temperature, tough, and any molten plastic you drip on will simply peel off when it cools. Step one is to ensure that you have the two halves of the mould aligned. You don't want to get that backwards or your part will be ruined. You can then place your printed blank on top of one half of the mould. And here I used a heat gun to get it up to temperature. We're not aiming to completely melt the plastic, just to get it to around 70 or 80 degrees so it becomes pliable. If the top surface becomes very shiny and molten, you know you've gone too far. Once it's properly flexible, you can add the second half of the mould on top and clamp quickly as the plastic will cool very fast. You can put something heavy on top of the mould halves, or in my case, I used a quick release clamp to maintain pressure while everything cooled down. Here's the first test piece that I moulded, and I'd have to say it's pretty flawless. The top looks like it's printed on a non-planar printer, and the results scaled up well at the full 100 by 100 millimeter size. I also wanted to experiment with using an oven to heat the blank, setting it on regular baking paper. I have a cheap standalone oven for the purpose of melting plastics, and I wouldn't necessarily recommend using your normal kitchen oven. It's actually very easy to overheat the plastic, in which case it shrivels and deforms in shape. This one was a little closer to the ideal temperature, but still too hot. Leaving the plastic on the paper and inserting it with the plastic into the mold made it easier to work with, but it also blocked visibility for correctly aligning the two halves of the mold. Again, I used multiple clamps to hold the two halves together while everything cooled. As I mentioned, I let the plastic get too hot and that means it stuck to the paper. The PLA did separate nicely from the PETG, but the high temperature actually changed the surface of the mold. And this means the finished product was soft enough to take on this distortion as well as the layer lines. Because of this, for thin materials, I'd highly recommend sticking with the heat gun. The results are much, much better. Now that geometry was pretty random, but a good example of thermoforming with a uniform thickness. But what if we have an object that's thin overall, but has variable thickness throughout the geometry with a shape that makes it quite difficult to 3D print with FDM. When I was still a school teacher, I had the pleasure of working with some outstanding young people in entering the F1 in schools competition, even becoming Australian champions. At the end of 2019, that booked us a trip to Abu Dhabi to compete in the world finals held at the same time as the Formula One Grand Prix. We even managed to win an international award. Now these cars are really fast. We're talking zero to 80 kilometers an hour in under one second. And there's a lot of engineering that needs to go into them to get them to perform that strongly. Furthermore, everything must be justified to the judges. So when design engineer Nick, seen here experiencing the fastest roller coaster in the world with me, decided to re-enter and invited me to be a mentor I was happy to take the opportunity to help them develop their car and try and come up with something different. This is our prototype F1 in schools car. This is the very first model that we made. Our rear wing, we usually would 3D print using polysmooth PLA filament, um, but that would usually require lots of support material and has a very poor finish because we, we're under a very short time frame. We, we have briefly investigated resin printing, but we found that it was too heavy um, to be practically useful because it was so heavy and our cars need to meet a minimum mass requirement. Thermoforming would be extremely useful to us for manufacturing our parts as we can get an extremely accurate skin finish which will improve the aerodynamics of our cars. Uh, a limitation with thermoforming is that it's always a uniform thickness which will not match our CAD designs as our rear wings are not a uniform thickness. So that brings us to our second technique called compression moulding. We're still forming a contoured shape, but instead of using a flat sheet, we're using something called a slug. The end result can vary in thickness, and again we need a two-part mould. Here we see our two-part mould open with the slug in place, and the first step is to heat up the slug to make it quite soft and pliable. We then close the mould, compressing the plastic and forming it into the shape left behind by the cavity. Once everything cools, the part can be ejected from the mold, and this technique, like thermoforming, is useful for making geometry that would be very hard to 3D print. 
Using the team's prototype rear wing, I again designed a two-part mould, extending the edges to let air and excess plastic escape. Like with thermoforming, I chose MDF to machine the two halves of the mould, and without any post-processing, they both turned out quite clean. Of prime importance is the fact that the two halves mate together nicely. For compression moulding we don't use a flat sheet, but instead use a slug, and I designed this one in CAD. The outer tip doesn't quite match, but the rest should be pretty close. The slug was placed on one half of the mould, and the whole lot put into the oven. In this case, we need the temperature to be high enough that the plastic really starts to melt. After that, we can put the mould together and apply some clamps to push everything into position. After everything cools, we can remove the clamps and open it up to reveal the part inside. The general shape is there, but plastic has oozed in between the two halves of the mould, and we call this effect flashing. Because I didn't do anything to seal the MDF mould, the plastic was molten enough to penetrate the surface, which was removed when I took the part out of the mould. What I should have done is apply a release agent, in this case hair wax. This has the job of sealing the surface of the MDF, making it less porous and less likely for the plastic to penetrate. It also forms a slippery layer, just to help the plastic release in general. The other weak point here is the design of the mould, so I modified it to offset where the two halves met. You can see that on one side the internal cavity is shifted upwards, whereas on the other half it's quite recessed. This drastically reduces the risk of the plastic oozing between the two halves and creating flashing, and it's a lot closer to the animated example I showed you earlier. I machined the mould pieces with the same technique, but this time chose a really dense hardwood. This would give a less fluffy, more precise edge, and it didn't take too much longer to machine. This time around I applied the wax straight away, and compared to oil, it doesn't swell the surface as much. The other thing you'll notice is a big improvement in the way the two halves mate together, thanks to some threaded holes and some long M8 bolts. Now the nuts can be tightened on the other side to pull everything together evenly. In one half, I also threaded some holes to drive in some bolts to release the two halves of the mould. The first test was conducted with the team present, and involved using some recycled PLA shreds. A heat gun and scraper was used to form this into a blank, although I had far too much material, so it was very difficult to get it into the mould. By the time we had done so, it had cooled too much and couldn't be squished into shape. Attempt 2 was with the printed slug, and again we used a heat gun to try and get it molten. This was pretty awkward, and I managed to twist one side, deforming it, but at least this time we could get the nuts tightened down, the two halves of the mould closed, and once everything had cooled, Nick was given the job of opening it up and inspecting the final part. The general shape was there, but the plastic wasn't quite hot enough to conform properly. So if we were to use this technique to manufacture our actual rear wing, um, after some refinement, we would end up using a, a, an aluminium mould and a more efficient heating process. And that is spot on, because in an industrial setting, not only would the slug be heated, but the mould as well. And this would greatly improve the flow of the plastic. We could, we could put the whole mould, the aluminium mould and the slug in the oven at the same time and keep it compressed in that oven and then just pull it out and then let it to cool and then that would be done much more quickly than this method. Back at home, I didn't have an aluminium mould, but at least I had my oven, so I waxed up the mould, softened and inserted a slug, and popped the whole thing into the oven. The timber actually acted as a heat sink, and I found it hard to melt the plastic, even with the oven at 200 degrees. To combat this, I tried to use a heat gun to melt the top side before applying the two halves of the mould. One successful change I made was using a rattle gun to very quickly get the nuts into place and tighten down the mould before the plastic could cool too much. Once again, I enjoyed the convenience of the rattle gun in opening the mould, and my system with the screws to release the two halves worked quite well. It was clear at a glance the plastic hadn't been hot enough, but I was still able to pry the part out from the mould and have a closer inspection. The overall shape is very close, and we have nicely tapered edges on the central part of the wing. The same can't be said about the trailing edges of the actual wing surfaces, they're a little bit blocky, and I guess that comes because the plastic was not hot enough. This is still the best result so far, and if the temperature of the plastic was hotter, 
the evidence that the blank is 3D printed would be gone and we would have a smoother surface finish like on this earlier example. Now it's up to the team to develop this idea and get it 100%. If, if you want to find more information about our team Photonic Racing, go to photonicracing.github.io. You can also follow us on social media, Instagram and Facebook. Photonic Racing, shine brighter. <laughs> this one's getting close, but it's not quite there yet. I think with a metal mold preheated in the oven and then the slug placed and heated for a little while longer, I think we will get excellent results. Now I understand that these techniques are not for everyone. If they're not for you, hopefully you still found it interesting and hopefully there's a few people out there that saw this and can be inspired for their next project. If you wanna give one of these techniques a try, please let me know how you intend to do so by posting below in the comments. If you're interested in mentoring or sponsoring Photonic Racing, their contact details are in the description as well. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.